teaching at Kenyatta University in the 80s and 90s, uh, particularly in sports education. And then in the 20s, you moved to law. Could you please tell the commission that journey of trans transiting from education to law? Thank you, Hanupo Chair. My life started uh, in a village called Namirama in Navaholo sub county of Kakameka County. Went to Namirama Primary School, a Musire High School, nicknamed Box 14, Chavakali High School, then University of Nairobi, where I obtained a first class honors Bachelor of Education degree 1981 masters in um, sports medicine and rehabilitation and phd in the same from cologne 1986-89 then came back um, to do service to the country honorable chair in the course of doing service to the country i traveled with the national junior soccer team to helsinki 1992 one of the boys punched somebody there and he was arrested now, the coach and team manager said, Dr. Women do not say, Wonky and our what? Sasa end out to say, Tiok to Amutietu. Honorable Chair, I felt totally handicapped. I thought I had attained, I thought I had read it all. Of course, I then went to the police. Uh, we had a long talk. They released our boy, and that ended it. But then at that moment, I started asking myself, what is this law and what authorities would Finland or authorities in Finland have over Kenyans? That's a question that started plucking my mind. Come the following year, Honorable Chair, we traveled to Cairo with the national, so with the senior team now. Uh, normally, clearances are very easy at customs. They see national team, collect passports, they are stamped in mass. We went through. Getting to Cairo, we were received by the football officials just before the customs, collected the passports, stamped, we get, got in. Coming back, each person was required to have their own passport. Then it turned out that the team manager had taken a passport that belonged to a different player and attached it to a player who didn't have a passport. So he was arrested at customs. Then once again, the coach and team manager say, Dr. Maneno, to Saidiye. I went to the customs officials, we had a chat, a long chat, but of course now at that point, my point was, here is the plane waiting. This person is going back to his home country. Why would you want him to sit here and live on your expenses? Kindly just allow us to go, we shall sort out this thing when we get home. He was eventually released. From then on, Honorable Chair, the seeds of studying law were sold. So then I went to law school, graduated with a bachelor's degree in 2002, master's. When I went to, the bachelor's, to do the bachelor's, my idea was to specialize in international law because of what I had experienced out there. But getting in, I found some more interesting areas like law science technology and sports law so i eventually diverted in that at the masters and phd honorable chair have i answered yes, the question yes I, I think you have professor and i noticed that uh, you use double doctor so you, you call yourself professor doctor doctor monweke so is that more of a german tradition or is it your preference honorable chair the desk, we have different academic cultures. Those people trained in the U.S., like the Honorable Chair, just write their names, Oli Mugenda, comma, PhD. In the U.K., just write Doctor, so and so, and it's done. In Central Europe, the culture is totally different. You write Professor, Doctor. If you have two doctorates, Professor, Doctor, Doctor. If you have three, the same thing. Okay, so it, it is a cut. So it is a culture I picked up from okay. uh, one of my alma mater. Okay. And Honorable Chair, it is doing wonders here also because uh, very many people have been encouraged. One came to see me in 2019. He said I had encouraged him. He had a PhD in entrepreneurship and a PhD in law. Wow. Okay. 
Thank you very much for that. Um, uh, Professor, again, looking at your CV, um, I noted that uh, you have held many, many leadership positions, uh, chairman of department, dean, and uh, different universities. So what leadership qualities do you possess, Professor, to make you a great CJ if we select you? Honorable Chair, I am a transformative leader. With that, I mean, I'm a good communicator. I'm good at problem solving. Bring in a problem, I'll see how to sort it out. I listen to others. I engage with others. I pay attention to other people's views. I build teams. I bring out the best in others. I encourage others to offer their best. I'm consultative, collegial, and all that that makes a good leader tick. Uh, so what is your understanding of a transformative leader? Because, uh, Professor, I think you can communicate well, you can listen, you can build teams, but you are still not able to transform. So what, what, is, what is a transformative leader? Honorable Chair, a transformative leader is one who is able to look at a vision, get the team to buy into the vision, set specific objectives, motivate people to work towards achievement of those objectives, and where one may be lacking behind or for whatever reason, the person is encouraged to come along. It's a way uh, through this uh, kind of leadership, we, one is able to carry everyone on board. One is able to encourage everyone to do their best. All through my leadership positions, I've always told people I've worked with that please tell me your strength. We cannot sit anywhere screaming about weaknesses. Tell me your strength. Let us build on your strength and see how together we can move this team forward, this organization forward, this school forward, this department forward. So, Prof, uh, could you tell us practical uh, examples or situations where you have transformed an institution or transformed a department or done something transformative? A uh, very practical example in the areas where you, you have been working. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. I started the School of Law at Mount Kenya. Hiring staff, recruiting students, ensuring that the staff deliver so that the customer is happy, more getting that together so that we all move and speak from the same language. Honorable Chair, while at Mount Kenya School of Law, I decided we needed to get our students to start behaving like lawyers. So I had a chat with the student leadership, had a chat with them, and we introduced the wearing of suits at Mount Kenya University School of Law. Monday, Tuesday, every student is in a suit. They like it very much, they look very responsible, they appreciate it, and that has taken root. And it's up and going. At Daystar University School of Law, now with a little hindsight, we made it Monday to Friday. So all law students look very smart. They look the part. They have chosen to be lawyers. They start that from day one, looking, behaving, thinking like lawyers. But let allow me also to mention, Honorable Chair, that um, around 2012, we had a problem as a country in the area of sports. Our athletes were winning, our teams were playing and winning, but there was a dark cloud hanging over our athletes because of an animal called doping. Doping is the use of prohibited substances or a form of cheating in sports so that one wins, not because they are putting their own effort, but because they have taken some drugs. At about that time, Honorable Chair, over 30 Kenyans had tested positive and their names were being flagged on websites globally. So then uh, we started getting bad publicity in the international press. 
The then Minister Honorable Tuoma tried to issue a press statement. He didn't help. Pressure started coming in, especially from the World Anti-Doping Agency. And the thinking in the international circles was, if these Kenyans are winning through cheating, we just lock them out. Let them compete amongst themselves. But then for a sports person, competition only makes sense if it's international and it's from the international competitions that they're able to make money. So then there was that threat. Come in after elections 2012, a new cabinet secretary comes in and he says, let's get to the bottom of this. So I was appointed to chair a task force on under to investigate matters of anti-doping in 2013. At the time of appointment, I was uh, doing something at the University of Brady Gigali. So I just got news of that while there came back. I found a wonderful team of 12 people I had never worked with before. Five lawyers, two medical doctors, one from Nakuru, another one from Mombasa, sports officials, and from the AG's office, from the ODPP, from the sports ministry, from everywhere. Twelve of us. After the first two meetings, Honorable Chair, we jailed. We worked on focusing on the objectives. We worked on the objectives, produced a report. The report was received by the government. It was very well received by the international community. The government acted on it. And as we sit here, Honorable Chair, we have an anti-doping law in place. We have an anti-doping agency in place. The international community is no longer doubting our sports persons. OK, thank you for those examples, Professor. I'm just thinking about um, the rule um, for students to wear suits Monday to Friday. And I'm just wondering whether, you know, when you think of a university student, you know, you're thinking of blue jeans and t-shirts. I mean, that, that's the life of a student. Now, if you, if they are wearing suits and nothing wrong with that, but have you considered those who may not be able to afford the suit Monday to Friday? Have you taken care of them? Oh, yes. <clears throat> Honorable Chair, that question came up in our discussions, especially at Mount Kenya. And it was in that light that the student said, OK, sir, we think the idea is very good. But then uh, some of us may not be able to afford five suits at a go. Meaning, if I have one suit and I'm wearing it five times a week, after one month, it will no longer look like a good suit. So kindly allow us to implement this in a progressive manner. So he said, OK. How do we do it? Then they suggested, we were discussing like in this semester to start the following semester. So they suggested, well, for the following semester, let us make it one day in a week. So we said, okay, Monday. The semester thereafter, we make it Monday and Tuesday. So we did it progressively to accommodate those who would have challenges. At days, the Honorable Chair, it is in the admission letter. It's part of the requirements. That, that you must come with? Oh, yes. Suits. OK. OK. Um, my last question to you, Professor, and I'm sure you have thought through the role of a Chief Justice. So if we nominated you to be the Chief Justice, Please tell the commission what you do the first three months, short, immediately, short term, maybe one year, and then long term. Honorable Chair, the first thing I will do after I come in in May next month is to work on mending relationships between the judiciary and the other arms of government. For me, that would be the first agenda on my list. The second agenda, Honorable Chair, is to build allies, to take the judiciary to the people. So far, the judiciary has done a lot. There are very wonderful reports about this and that and percentages. But 
somebody in the village in Magarin doesn't know about that. Boda Boda riders gathered somewhere in Kakamega don't know about that. So my next agenda would be to take the judiciary to the people. What am I saying in practical terms, honorable commissioners? We have professional bodies here. We have the uh, Kenya Medical Association. We have the prof uh, human, uh, what's that, HR professionals. We have this and that. I want the judiciary to be present at each of their annual meetings. We get a slot and just tell them about the judiciary, what we do. All the professional bodies and all of them hold annual meetings. The second group, Honorable Chair, the Asso Kenya Association of Manufacturers, we read about them there, we meet them in court, but they are also human beings, they are people. I would want us to have a session with them, a structured meeting with them, just to tell them about the judiciary, what the judiciary does, and all that, so that they also can you know, buy into the judiciary, accept it as their own. Honorable Chair, we have trade unions in this country. We hear about them when there are disputes in court, but I would want us to have occasion when they are having their normal meetings. We send there, say, Commissioner Koske, to go and talk to them about what the judiciary has done, what the judiciary is doing. Honorable Chair, we have law schools at the moment, our relationship with law schools is not, uh, is not formulated at all. With respect to law schools, Honorable Chair, I'll wonder about three forms of engagement. Number one, we get all employees of the judiciary who have postgraduate degrees to offer to teach at least one course at the university. So if someone is CPA, doctor so and so in finance, let the person identify the university where the person can teach at least one course in finance. I want this magistrate in Homer Bay who has a master's degree to volunteer at least three hours to go and teach. Let us be able to interact with other members of the university system so that they are, they are also able to feel the judiciary. Honorable Chair, at the moment, law schools have better courtrooms than the judiciary. And this is because the moot courtrooms are molded along the lines of the courts at the Hague, beautiful, networked, and so on. Added to that, courtesy of the kinds of legal education, each law school has some kind of area of focus or specialization. I would want us, I would want the judiciary to enter into some kind of structured engagement with each of these law schools so that using their uh, ports of strength, they are able to develop moot court sessions, which would then eventually be televised. We have very many TV stations. So we can have, for example, Citizen running a program on family law offered by Catholic University. We have uh, NTV running a program on environmental law from the University of Nairobi. We have KTN running a program on communications law from Daystra University. And so on. But then again, weekly programs. When we were growing up, we used to hear of Bioja Makamani. I would want us to improve on that aspect of Bioja Makamani so that we use this and through the linkages with the universities to be able to sell the message of the judiciary to the law schools. I'm thinking about these border border riders in very many centers. They have a stake in the judiciary. I would want us to have set up some kind of way in collaboration with the NGOs to be able to reach out to the border border riders, to be able to reach out to these uh, traders in, at open air markets, to be able to reach out wherever so that they also get to know about the judiciary. And I have thought through this, Honorable Chair, 
I would want to package four points. Number one, how does the judiciary work? Number two, alternative dispute resolution mechanisms. Number three, obeisance of court orders. And number four, corruption. If we are able to package these four points, which can be packaged in a 15 to 20 minutes presentation, sell it to our border border riders, sell it to people everywhere. They will be able to move with us. They will be able to co 